for AFS, and I have the great honor of working uh, with my boss, the creative uh, director of um, Austin Film Society and founder, uh, Richard Linklater. And uh, one thing he came uh, to us about a couple months ago and asked was like, is there any way that we might have time to pay tribute to Peter Bogdanovich? And it didn't take us long to say, yes, 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 we love Peter Bogdanovich. Let's do it. Uh, Rick happened to have a little bit of time between projects and was kind enough to join us uh, for these. And we selected some films that I think could not have been better chosen because you look at these films and you see Peter Bogdanovich's relationship with Hollywood, with uh, the, the people who are his heroes in Hollywood, some of whose names you know and some of whom you may have barely heard of. Uh, but all of, those, all of those sort of influences come to the fore in these films. And it's been a great series. Has anybody here been here for all three of the films? Yeah, it's like you get such a broad sense of Bogdanovich's uh, work and his lens on old Hollywood when you watch this series. And this is maybe the ultimate film for giving that lens on old Hollywood. Uh, but I, at this point, would like to bring to the stage Richard Linklater to tell you a little bit about this film and about Peter Bogdanovich. Come on up, Rick. exciting to be here with the full theater watching Nickelodeon on the big screen. We're the only place in the world doing that right now. Well, maybe not, but we're, we're really just happy to be here. And in black and white, too. So um, there's been other versions of this movie over the years. But um, yeah, like Lars was saying, you know, paying tribute to Peter, I really wanted to show these two. We started with What's Up, Doc? But, you know, I asked some people, why are you showing those films? I was like, because I think last week's film, and Long Last Love, and Nickelodeon, which we're about to see, I think they're the two most misunderstood, underrated, you know, whatever category you want to put that in. And they sort of suffered in their time. Let's face it, at Long Last Love, last week's movie, uh, you know, we talked a lot about how just out of time in, in post-Watergate 1975, you know, the world just wasn't ready for this frolic from the 30s. You know, this just wasn't the mood. And so, and you know, he was asking a lot, you know, to go back to the 30s was like, if you were young or even, you know, that was kind of your grandparents' era, you know? So what I love about Peter and I love about this movie is all those things that might give you pause to do no, This movie doubles down <laughs> on both those things. <laughs> 76, let's say, that's at this very moment, films like, Network are showing, is it in the theater? Brooding movies, Taxi Driver's coming out, you know, All the President's Men. You couldn't get less broody and <laughs> about its time than the movie we're about to see. And not only, it's not set in the 30s, he kicks it back another 20 years to like pre-feature pre film era. We're talking two reelers, we're talking Cinema wasn't even fully mature yet. It's not even, it's being invented as we speak. And that's the charm of this movie. I think Peter's asking you to just come back for the sheer excitement of an art form coming into being. That no one, there's no rules. No one has a background. Think of it. Um, no one is trained for this. No one, you can't like, oh, I want to be a filmmaker someday. It's like, no, it's, it was happening in front of you. Not one person making films had planned on it in their youth. It was just kind of these opportunities and this thing that was happening. And this film is, it, it's kind of like a two-reeler. It's like a good silent film. It's, you know, irises for transitions, no opticals, a lot of sight gags, you know. Uh, you know, you can say slapsticky or that kind of humor. Uh, Peter was just a master, so deft at visual humor. So this is a real sweet spot for him. But, um, Oh, I was only trying to thought it was <laughs> But it's just the pure joy of, of this movie. Ryan O'Neill plays kind of a, he's sort of a, oh, I won't say bumbling, but let's just say kind of bumbling attorney who uh, he just kind of, he meets this film producer played by Brian Keith, if I remember correctly. They're not in LA, somewhere else. He's kind of on the run. He's, he's the, the patent guy. You can feel the industry's changing 
Uh, there's starting to be bigger companies trying to control it all. And the little guys, you know, there are a lot of patent lawsuits trying to keep people from doing it. They're still figuring out the industry. That will come. By the end of the movie, the, the industry will, you'll get a sense of where the industry is going. There's a such thing as a feature film. And, you know, the big guys are going to take it over. But we're, we're seeing that wonderful little moment where it's just, it's freedom. And so this lawyer, he hooks up with, you know, he gets sent to some cow town in Southern California, it's Cucamonga, you know, back then. There's a production out of control. I think the director has run off with the payroll or something, drunk. And uh, and so he's there trying to figure it out. And, um, you know, there's a beautiful woman, he's, you know, Jane Hitchcock is wonderful. She's, she's a dancer and then there's this, you know, cowboy stuntman, gonna, you know, segueing into a stuntman career, Burt Reynolds, back from last week. He's fantastic. And they just this kind of, he's entangled with these people. Oh, and there's the, the smart aleck uh, teenager, like Tatum O'Neill, is uh, he finds out she's probably a better writer than he is. He's just trying to figure out, and, and there's no director, so he just kind of is, finds himself directing this movie. And it's kind of, I guess it's sort of a parody in a certain way, because he's like, well, what do I do? And he's, the, the camera guy just says, well, here's the actors, here's the camera, just, you know, tell them what, and then when he got enough, just say cut, you know? And so, <laughs> and so I think that it's, it's, it's just funny, you know? It's just funny, and um, it's, it's just in love with this era, and it's an obscure era. It's not like, it's less accessible, but he's asking all of us to go back to that time and you know he did it black and white because so that was his goal it wasn't always shown in black and white sometimes it was shown in color but um he said that was the you know the funniest movies ever are you know buster keaton chaplin harold lloyd you know this movie could have come out of hal roach studios or something like that so he thought color would just distract you from the visuals you know so this is kind of his purely this pure essence of what he was trying to take us back to and, and enjoy. So, um, gosh, what else? Um, John Ritter makes it his first Bogdanovich appearance. The great John Ritter, he plays the cameraman. Uh, Stella Stevens is in this. She's great. So, I don't know. It's just a joyful movie. Like I said last week, Long Last Love. Let's accept this with the same love and appreciation that he made it. I know for a fact Peter loved this movie it was very dear to his heart and again I, i'll say it again peter's career is often seen as this up and down thing but i think with this film look at the 70s output look what's coming in the future i just think it's amazingly consistent you know the times change but he kind of didn't he made the film you know it's so admirable you know you have a bomb some films and People don't like you or your films, just make the next film. It's so inspiring. And this was the next film, something deep from his heart that he really wanted to convey to us. And um, and we'll talk more after the film. We've got a really special guest tonight. I'm so thrilled she's in town because she was Peter's longtime you know, collaborator on things and his life partner to the very end, Louise Stratton. Say hi. <laughs> Louise, my old friend. I'm not sure. We're going to come up here and talk after about, um, so glad she's in town, we're going to come just talk about Peter, his whole life, career, and, you know, Peter was very busy at his, at, you know, in January when he, he left us too soon, you know, he had a lot he was working on, so we'll talk about that, and uh, let's just enjoy this movie, and if you want to see Paper Moon, it's playing tomorrow night at the Paramount, so go see that, 35 at the Paramount, but we're showing Nickelodeon tonight, <laughs> No one's doing that, so, okay. <laughs> Enjoy the movie, and I can't wait to talk to you guys after. All right, thanks for being here. That was funny. See what I meant about the, just getting in the spirit of it. You have to really accept that movie as a two-reeler, as a pre you know. If you really accept it as a silent comedy, all the pratfalls and all the, the kind of joyfulness of it. But, you know, the cautionary note I gave before is like, yeah, people in 76 just thought that was, you know, what does it have to do with your life right now? It's from such an other era, you know, this film's so timeless in a way. Well, Nickelodeon doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, I know. It's right? Just, whew, it's, I yeah, know. It's, it was, it's just old. It's an old-timey movie from a time that is long gone. Right. Totally gone. <laughs> yeah. So. But um, what did it felt like for you? 
You know, I just saw this movie with Peter uh, over the Christmas holidays. Really? And he just loved it. Oh. In black and white. Yeah, yeah. I heard that Glasgow and him um, lit it for black and white. Yeah. And um, his suggestion was watching in color to turn down the color on the TV. Oh. Just to see it that way. But now you got to see it in black and white. So. Yeah. And what happened with the studio? Was that just a... Um, just a compromise? Did they insist that we go out in color? I think that he was lucky to make the last picture show in black and white because yeah. they wanted to make that in color. Right. Paper moon. You fought those fights. Right. But as long as your films are making money, they, they say yes. But, you know. Which one came right before this, though? From here? Before this? Long yeah, Last Love. That's right. Yeah. And it didn't do well. So no, yeah. Maybe that had something to do with it. Yeah. So, and compromise. I think yeah, then you start you start right. feeling the there's we talked about that last week, just the, the reality of just the art and commerce world of filmmaking that, you know if the film's not uh, testing well, you know, you have these previews and if those don't you know, you're in the doghouse and you everybody gets desperate. It's it's pretty pretty wild. I know he had to fight those those fights, you know, all the way recently. How you, you? You guys, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of fights to me, yeah, you know, that's, that goes with the, the territory. But, but you know, seeing this, you see, well, they're fighting the fights right here, that's you know? The, that's the point. Yeah, exactly. So, I love it, like, he goes from attorney to a guy with a vision, you know? In a few years, he's like, don't recut what I did. You know, this is, a, he, has a, he, he has an exact in his head how it should be. You cut it to ribbons. You know, that speech he gives, that indignant and speech. And direct. Yeah. <laughs> From that to like, um, you know, you got to start taking him serious. I just think Burt Reynolds and Ryan O'Neill are so good together in this. They're just a joy. They seem happy. And yeah, Burt Reynolds, I think, is just amazing. I think yeah. I love the fact that he can make fun of himself. You oh, know? yeah. He always had that sense of humor. Mm -hmm. I mean, at this point in history, he's the big, he and Ryan O'Neill are two of the biggest stars in the world, and they're having fun, that fight that goes on forever. You know, that's just like, I hope they were having as much fun as, it just feels like if someone would find another joke and another thing, and the excess, the, the, you know, I can just see Peter's love for that. Oh, let's fall through one more thing. A lot of stuntmen had a pretty good gig on this movie. But how much of it was them, actually, do you think? I don't know. I should have asked Peter that. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that that's question. a good question. Like, because I mean, I guess at this point people are familiar with those, with those films. So, but no one loved him as much as Peter, and and knew them, you know, as well. You know, I didn't say in my intro, a lot of this movie was inspired by. You know, he interviewed all these old old directors when he first got out of Hollywood in the '60s. He, you know, these, so many of the directors were still alive, and he just did this series of interviews. And a lot of this, and got to know him. And a lot of these, you know, he thanks at the end, Alan Dwan, Roll Wash, and um, he talked about Leo McCary and some of the other guys. You know, like, they had stories from this era. So a lot of these are just, there's a little bit of folklore, like tearing out the pages of the script. I think that's an old John Ford story. But some of the other stuff, these were stories from that actually happened on films during this era. I think this is an homage to John Ford in a lot yeah. of ways. You know, uh, Harry Carey Jr. was in the film, mm -hmm. um, and just you could you, with the music. Yeah. Um, uh, Take me home, Kathleen. Right. Right. Was that from the Ford film? Yeah. 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 I think so. It all feels yeah. familiar. And there's even Buster Keaton. That's know? right. You know, around there at the beginning. We did a Buster Keaton documentary. Yeah, which is wonderful. It was a lot of fun to make, yeah. Yeah, that was Peter's last film officially, I guess. The Great Buster. Officially, yeah. right. Yeah. So, what were you guys working on at the time when we passed away? Well, uh, we uh, wrote a script that is about the Gershwin brothers, and um, it's called Our Love is Here to Stay. Mm -hmm. And it's a love story between the two brothers. Yeah. And we finished the script, and um, about two weeks after Peter passed, we were to bring it to Netflix and um, get a green light on that. Yeah, oh, with, with um, Guillermo. Was helping. Guillermo del yeah. Toro is, is still going to produce it, mm -hmm. and we're still going to make it, but we're going to look for a director to take Peter's place. Mm -hmm. um, and you guys worked on it. 
the first week I was talking, we showed what's up doc and I told everybody, you know, if you want to see the great double feature here would be jump to 45 years later and see the film that's called She's Funny That Way, but the Louise co-wrote and produced with him, right? What, but that's, that has a new future. You going back to your original title? And so the title? original title of She's Funny That Way is yeah. called Squirrels for Nuts. Right, and it's in the movie. <laughs> That, that, the joke, right, right, and um, it pays off, and it's a much yeah. better film. Okay. And Lionsgate um, agreed to. Well, Peter, when Peter was alive, he went to uh, Lionsgate and wanted to do a director's cut on that, and they found a lot of footage that was cut out, and uh, they they did it. We did it. We all did it, mm -hmm. and we showed it at MoMA in New York about a month and a half ago, and it's going to be released on Netflix, I believe. This summer. Oh, great! Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. So you guys check out this movie. It's it's so it's it's wonderful. It's I don't know. I just Owen Wilson's what, great. In it yeah. And Jennifer Aniston, Owen Wilson, yeah. uh, Catherine Hahn, Chris Evans, Imogene Poots. Yeah, she's wonderful. Yeah. Um, yeah, I I guess, uh, yeah, it, it's weird that Peter had to, you know, these director cuts that some of the films weren't to his spec. I guess, you know, we, we talked about Other Side of the Wind last week too, the one he's acting in, Orson's movie, you know, that he got to help get that finished finally. So with I guess- Frank, you, you With Frank Marshall. Yeah, Frank, who's in this he's, movie. Well, he's got a cameo, yeah. and Frank's, uh, well, John Ritter's character's name is Frank Frank. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> Peter's <laughs> nickname for Frank Marshall, who now is a big producer. Yeah, he has been. Uh, his name, it, Peter called him Frank Frank all these years. Oh. <laughs> Very cute. Yeah, well, I just, the long career those guys had together. You know, watching it this time, when I first watched this movie, I didn't know this, but watching it this time, I know that the um, Brian Keith Cobb, the manic producer, let's say, that Peter wanted Orson Welles to play that part. <laughs> Absolutely. He was going to do it, and then he um, he uh, opted out at the last minute. You know, I, I think that's a good thing. I don't think Wells could have pulled it off in it that pace. It would have been distracting, I think. It would have been distracting, and by 75, I guess, when they were shooting, yeah. he, would have, he wouldn't have gone all the way the way Brian Keith right. did. You know, and I think he, he grabbed the spirit. I don't know if Wells is energy, and let's face it, Wells, he wasn't a snappy actor like that. He was... That's right. Big so it's called a happy accident. That's what people yeah. call it. But I think um, uh, Brian Keith. I think he's just amazing in the movie. Yeah. He's just so great. I remember him yeah. from my childhood. Uh, what was that series he was on? I'm trying to think. Family Affair. Family Affair. Family Affair. Buffy oh, okay. and Jody. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's what it was. It's yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All these great actors they get known. You know, I grew up thinking Barbara Stanwyck is just that that older lady on. Yeah, uh, right. Yeah, you don't know they have these long careers, you know. The dad yeah, from my three sons, like, and you watch Devil Indemnity, you go, oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's just we get the TV, you know, you see, you learn things backwards. Right. Kind of you do. Yeah. yeah. If, depending on when you drop into this mm -hmm. world. Yeah. Brad McMurray? Yeah. Is that? Yeah. Right. You know, you just, you know him as a kid, and then you go back and. Even uh, Leave It to Beaver's dad, Hugh Beaumont, tough guy, some film noir. It's like a Beaver, for God's sake. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's just love a long career, you know? Right. And, yeah, it's. Um, Why did you choose this movie? Just curious. Well, I think Long Last Love and this, I just think they get the. I, I just think they get the least amount of love, and I, I'm, I think Peter had such a good decade in the 70s. You know, he made these seven films, they're all good. You know, and I just think he was on quite a roll. Like after this, also didn't do well. If you want to just go on Rotten Tomatoes and read the reviews of this film at the time, so dismissive. Guess what the rating for this is on Rotten Tomatoes? Eight percent. Eight. Fucking eight. Did we just watch an eight? But I back mean, then it's there was no Rotten Tomatoes. No, no, of course. They're going back and just I taking know, know. the top, you know, 15 reviews. But from the majors, they just were so dismissive. They so weren't in the spirit of this movie. Like I, I keep saying, it just, it dropped into a world that no one was, they just weren't in the mood, you know? You make a timeless movie about a 
thing in the past that I think holds up and, and means a lot for the future. It just, it risks not being of its time. So I think um, those two films in particular, I think Long Last Love, I guess you could put Daisy Muller in that a little bit too, you know, period film. Um, yeah, they were just not connecting with the audiences of that time. But I, like I said, my premise for this whole series is like, Peter didn't change. He just made his next movie from his heart, mm -hmm. you know? And the times changed, the, you know, they were just, so he had to, you know, he took a few years off after this and came back with St. Jack and they all laughed. You know, he just kept going, which I, I really admire, you know? Yeah. When we first met, he had just finished um, a thing called Love it was in the, you know, 93 or so, which is right. a wonderful movie. Mm -hmm. You know, a little old fashioned, you know, in a, in a way. But, you know, what he always has in common is just great performances. I think that Peter, really in a way, was ahead of his time a lot of times, including yeah. just as many things. And uh, he also just was, I just loved the fact that he tried a lot of different genres. Mm -hmm. And, um, Ahead of his time, meaning that he was, well, what am I saying? I mean, all these movies have already been made, you know, in the sense of musicals and westerns. Right, the genres. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, the genres, yeah. My favorite shot in this whole movie is that one long shot when they're now at the new place. And it's one long shot of running, going from set to set, movie to movie. Oh, I know. And they're all different. <laughs> just different. <laughs> That's pretty amazing tableau. Just the shots. Didn't Wes Anderson the just do that? Master of the long called? shot. French, uh, French dispatch. dispatch. He did that, didn't he? I just... where, where, is that where Wes got his lateral? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But uh, yeah, Wes I was a it. Wes is a of course. wonderful acolyte of Peter. They're I mean, friends. Yeah, you know, if, if Peter had a real gift. He was always so kind. You know, I didn't live in the town he did, but every time I saw him, he was, he was always so generous, and he, he really younger filmmakers loved him. You know. Mm -hmm. And he was so generous with people, and there was a certain, I don't know, he had a gift for friendship. He really loved your films a lot. Oh, he was always so nice really to me. really did. And, um, you know, the first time I met him, he had seen my movie, um, Days and Confused. And he called me over, the mm -hmm. he said, hey, you want to, so I went and visited him, you were there, and um, he told me, yeah, your film really, it disturbed me. <laughs> you know, but he picked up on the, what I felt from my heart was like the darker undertones. He goes, "Yeah, I just see these these kids, and I think they just don't have a life." You know, going forward, he felt a certain doom for all of them, all that. It kind of creeped me out. I said, "Well, you know, I'm glad you said that because when I saw Last Picture Show, Sunny on the Sidelines, this year out of high school, yeah. called him that thing. I said that creeped me out. <laughs> you know, so I guess it just made me sad." So, I don't know, I appreciate it. He saw something else in it that most people didn't. Mm -hmm. And so, but uh, I didn't run into him. I remember being at the, we were at the Denver Film Festival together when Cat's Meow oh, was, was first shown. Absolutely, yeah. Which is, that's a wonderful movie. If you haven't seen Cat's Meow, again, old Hollywood. Um, wonderful movie. It's the famous Hearst Thomas Ince on the boat mm -hmm. scandal. Just old Hollywood, beautifully done. Beautifully done. Kirsten Dunst plays Marion Davies. She's incredible. Yeah. And he's her playing Chaplin, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, oh, um, who's playing Hearst? The, he's in. Uh, oh, yeah. Edward uh, Herman. What? Herman. Oh, Edward he's Herman. amazing. Yeah, he's so good. Yeah. Yeah. He is amazing. You'll know him from the Gilmore Group. He's great. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he's, and Red, he's, he's a wonderful actor. But Peter always got these wonderful actors and just got these so nuanced performances. It was like a ring law film or something. Absolutely. It was always so great to talk to Peter. You just, you were immediately talking about older, you know, directors. Just who you. I was really, I, I, want, I don't want, uh, lucky, fortunate to have met many yeah. of these older directors that I just am so, I'm just so blessed to have met them. Mm -hmm. You know? And you get Orson Welles stories. <laughs> Besides the fact that I was terrified. Yeah. <laughs> terrified. Um, I would imagine. Yeah, I was very, uh, it, it just because he's such a big personality that mm -hmm. I was, I was so happy to meet him, but I just stood there and just 
listened, you know. Yeah. So we had dinner one couple times, but I just was absolutely just wanted to hear because he would laugh and it would be bellowing and laugh, yeah. oh my gosh, but yeah, well, a lot of fun. Peter's book on his is wonderful. This is Orson Welles, and I don't know, he's seen. Well, it seems like a long, complex relationship, but I guess. I know that they loved something. each other, yeah. and uh, on the other side of the wind, I do know that that, you know, it was just, there was a lot of love there, but I think it was a bit complicated, you know. Yeah. With, I think, every relationship, in a way, somehow, somewhere. Yeah, our industry kind of it drives people, it, it kind of wants to divide people in a certain way. It's a lot, of, a lot of pressures and stuff. I don't know. Mm -hmm. If you're not generous, it can be petty jealousies and stuff too. Unfortunately. Else, Unfortunately. Yeah. Get older and they're not making your That's movies. It. And that, then you're young guys, the toast of the town, and it's kind of like, oh, why don't yeah. they make my movies? You know, Is it a love hate or something? It's yeah. just odd. If thing. not hate, it's just kind of. Yeah. But. Can I talk a bit about the podcast? Oh, yeah. Okay. I've mentioned it before. Like, I was just a. It's. it's I was so looking forward to doing this podcast. I, I picked Edgar Ulmer. To, uh, we were just about to do it. I, I <laughs> talked about it a couple of weeks ago. It, it was just such a loss that I carry. But talk about the podcast. Are those available? Because that's such a good idea. It's such a... Well, Peter had all these old recordings yeah, from these years ago when he would interview all these different directors. And he had them all on these uh, just recordings. And yeah. he wanted to try to do something with them. And then when podcasts came in, he felt like it's, you know, God, this is like radio. This is just going back to radio. And then he thought, you know, how can I recycle this? And he, he thought, well, I'll do a podcast. Well, he did the podcast on TCM. Yeah, which is great. And he loved the doing thinking. it. Yeah. And he loved doing it so much that he said, I want to do this. I want to keep doing this. So he came up with an idea all of a sudden. He said, why don't I take these old recordings of all these different directors that I have? Because he, he, you know, he did these the books that he did. Yeah, thank God he held on to them. Thank goodness. And he then thought, okay, what if we go into a room and I can have a list? First of all, I'll have the list of different directors that I have on these recordings, and I'll call some friends and say, hey, look, pick a director on, on this list, and let's get in a room and talk about them and it's almost like they're in the room with you because he'll play pieces of recordings and then sometimes he'll trick you by asking you a question i shouldn't expose that piece but <laughs> he'll ask you a question and see if you'll answer it or how you'll answer it and then he'll play the question he asked back in the day with his young boys mm -hmm. asking the question to orson wells or whomever I and know. then play it for well, yeah. well, you were about to do it. His interviews, I, I listen to the interviews and they're, they're really fascinating because they're not so much of, I mean, Peter is a historian, great journalist, all that, but the questions are coming from a future director. They're coming from someone who feels like they're ready mm -hmm. to make their first film. You know, they're asking, yeah. He's asking directorial questions. Exactly. So it's different than most journalistic interviews. It's, it's yeah. filmmaker to filmmaker, even though he's, just he's a young you know beginning but the questions are so astute so i don't know it, it's fascinating to, to hear them and those answers i don't know it, it's a you know how people just rave forever as they should about the truffaut hitchcock well book you know it's like oh a young filmmaker with someone they know the whole all those are like that he did a series of truffaut hitchcock's with every director he talked to so that to me, that's just gold. No, it's like gold. It's Golden. just gold. It's you know? film gold. Oh. And I had picked Edgar Ulmer because the name of my little production company is Detour Film Production. That's the great Edgar Ulmer, you know, Poverty Row movie. And so I said, well, I got it. And it was so fun, Peter. You know, he, he would call you up, and I was fortunate because we were going to do this. That I had numerous con long conversations with him, which you know immediately just become. You just laugh. You have that great laugh, and he Amazing. just telling stories, and you know, talking about films and life, and I don't know. I just really am grateful for that time 
just talking to him. This is over the pandemic, largely. And he was so excited. He's like, podcast, oh, yeah, there's a, it's like radio. And uh, it's so he, old, it's new, he would say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he had that great voice. He, he was such a good performer, mm -hmm. you know, himself, and an actor. And, um, so how many of those got, I don't know, Guillermo? Who did yes, you? I, I was I was coming up, but how many? So they did, uh, Guillermo del Toro uh, picked Alfred Hitchcock. Surprise, surprise. And then right. uh, <laughs> and then Quentin did Don Siegel. Okay, perfect. And then uh, Ken Burns did John Ford. And uh, Ryan Johnson picked Orson Welles. Mm -hmm. um, we did four. Yeah. So and it was we have be, two left. You know, you're supposed to talk about like how that director influenced you or what choices you know you just talk about their careers well i yeah i mean peter created this format that he was doing it was like going back to the old days and doing the interviews but mm -hmm. now would be a new interview and combining the old one with it was so cool like having uh, Guillermo in the room, and then all of a sudden you're hearing Alfred Hitchcock. Guillermo's in the room with in. Hitchcock. You know, you and I was his co-host. It was really a lot of fun. So he ended up calling it One Handshake Away. And, oh. uh, that's just, that's sweet. Like cute. And I just, I'm excited about it. It's going to come out out of oh, launch, good. I guess. Um, we have two more to do. Mm. And so we're trying to figure out how to finish them, which I think we have a plan. But I more almost there so yeah. i looked through a list of directors and i said well i gotta do homework but i also wanted to you know the hitchcocks and people like that i was like as much as you fantasize about a studio career like oh that would have been fun and i say this about peter you know had he come of age in the 40s and 50s you know he had this great studio career where you make two films a year at mgm i just think he would have flourished you know in that in the studio system, perhaps, but everybody fantasizes, oh, that'd be fun to, you know, work at Fox or Daryl Zanuck and make all these films, but I was like, no, if I was there, I would, I would have got kicked out of that. I would be <laughs> over the hill in Poverty Row <laughs> doing the film in 12 days for no money with it. Like, yeah, that's a reality for most filmmakers, so yeah. I thought I was going to re try to represent that the low budget, what you do with no money, you know, which El Ed Romer was good at. You know, you look at his films, you know, he was the, you know, the horror film with the sm lot of smoke and darkness, you know, because there's nothing there. It's a magic trick, you know, so that's, that was like, okay, that's, I don't know, I, I was looking forward to talking about Poverty Row of Hollywood, Absolutely. not not the top of the studio, you know, we all love it, I, I love it, but that's, I like just, a reality. Well, watching this film, I, I just really felt Peter. I felt like, you know, that was his film. I really mm -hmm. felt his humor. Yeah. I felt I could, you know, the sort of homage to Paper Moon when she drives yeah. up in that truck. It, it was such a nice reveal. Mm -hmm. um, different moments, and um, it was just nice to see that. And, you know, that line that he says, uh, you know, little. Uh, pieces of time. Pieces of time. That's so moving. His yeah. last. Yeah. It's, you know, little pieces. A little. Uh, pieces of time that they might remember. Correct. Yeah. Well, it, this film is so unique. I can't think of that many others that really you see an art form being born. Yeah. In the from the where, where this film starts to the where it ends. Obviously, at the. Um, Birth of a Nation, which is, you know, the signpost of cinema changing. That was, you know, okay, it's all going to be, is like probably more profound than talkies or as profound. It's like, oh, Nickelodeon's art. He says it coming out of the movie. He's like, okay, this, you know, at least at least seven reels longer. You know, the feature film is born here. Right. You know, so. But it's where I forgot it was called. I guess it was called the Klansman in some places, and Birth of a Nation in others, or whatever. It's such a, it's it's weird. Birth of a Nation. How many of you here have seen all of Birth of a Nation? That's pretty good. I remember watching it in Charlie Nafis's ACC class in Lake Forest, <laughs> writing a. I think the assignment was a four-page paper. I wrote about a twelve-page paper. <laughs> it's such a complex movie. I know now it's almost it's a canceled movie, but it. 
it it's a really, complicated subject. Yeah, yeah. Okay. deeply complicated, but it's, it is the birth of, of cinema and as we know it today. It's a stunning movie. The first half of the movie is a great, it's a great war movie. The second half obviously is, you know, it's super, it's, it's view of reconstruction is, you know, unfortunately still the view of uh, a certain percentage of our population it seems, but uh, um, yeah, it's that lost cause audio. And you know, Griffith made hundreds of films and he made half of a super racist film that is unbelievable to watch, but it's an interesting history lesson. I don't think we should ban it. I think That's we, the point. It's I think history. we should watch it point? and know, okay, this film, this view of our country's history was so valid at the time. And this film makes fun. It's 1976 making fun of 1912. You know, cowboys and Indians, blackface and all that. And it's kind of, our culture's changed. It's like even the depiction of people making fun of it then is, feels a little weird. So you can't even depict it, or why would you, you know, now, but, you know, that's, that's the history, and that's what, you know, they're kind of making fun of in the thing, but, uh, you know, Birth of a Nation, it's still, yeah, it's, it's such a, it's like your founding fathers being, you know, it's, it's the number one poem, it's, it's a, yeah. Exactly. Complex to be nice. but uh, you know, <laughs> Griffith would he? There's a reason he's in this movie so much. He did kind of invent the modern, mm -hmm. the modern movie. He was just kind of from the south and should have known better. Right. Like most artists, we expect artists to know better, to be ahead of the time. But he was of his time. The film showed at the fucking White House. You know. Right. So to great reviews. So that was our culture. Mm -hmm. So we should all study that from right. what that fact is, you know. And Peter kept wearing the bandana scarves up until he passed. Yeah. You know, kind of and then people would say, yes, I like your ass It's a bandana scarf. <laughs> 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 he started wearing them on the last picture show, and then he kept wearing them, you know. That was his thing. They good on him. Yeah, that was his thing. <laughs> So the, the, the time of, of Peter's um, generation of directing, that was called, what, you, you what is it called? Uh, well, they were largely movie brats. I thought it was, um, that, that's what they referred to a lot of those directors. I never heard him refer to as that, but no, a lot I'm of I'm wondering if there was a term for it, I guess maybe that's it. I don't know. Anyone? New Hollywood. New Hollywood. Yeah, New Hollywood, 70s. Yeah. Yeah. What did you think of that era? New Hollywood. For you? Well, everybody, we love it. Everyone reveres it as, you know. I've seen, I remember I was in Vienna and they had a, whole, a big series of 70s movies. And the, the name of the series was Last Picture Show. Because they, they were saying, they were positing that that was the last great American. Basically, they say 69 to about 80. You know, all the great movies made in that era. Before the blockbusters that we meet? Yeah, just before Hollywood changed, you know, like okay. 1980, Heaven's Gate, you know, it changed. I have an ongoing series I've been doing for years. It's like Bob Dylan's never ending tour <laughs> called Jewels in the Way. I'm doing the 80s because I think the 70s has been covered so well. So, I'm, my theory, and it just so happens to be when, when I fell in love with cinema in the early 80s and started watching everything. So I'm saying the 80s were actually really good. Let's not forget the 80s. But it was a different industry completely. The execs took over. But my point is artists always find a way. They find a way. They get their movies made. Peter found a way. Absolutely. Yeah. You have. He kept finding a way. Yeah, <laughs> you, yeah you just got It's just the way it is, right? Yeah, it's always passion. been that way. It's, it's never, way it's never handed to you. And, interviews with these directors, the ones you think had it made, who had these great studio careers, and right. they struggled, you know, in every step. It's just, art is a struggle. It's never been easy. No one's given that much. You feel like you have to kind of create, even if you have the support, you're still, a, there's a battle going on always on some right. level of bringing something into existence, so. Roger Corman threw Peter into the deep end, I think, didn't he? Just yeah. A, you know, it was pretty amazing first film. Targets. I know. I talked about that on our first screening. I went on. I had a much longer intro, much more context to Peter's career. I just didn't want to do it every week. So if you weren't here this first week, that was my full download. But I talk about how um, Targets, I think, is one of the great first films 
ever made. And, and, and a lot has changed, actually. Yeah. yeah, and the way they did it back then. Back then, like Peter and you know Coppola and Scorsese, everybody you had to go to L.A. and just try to get try to get films made. The, the idea of staying in your own backyard and making an indie film that that wasn't how you did it. You know, there wasn't an industry for that. So you went out there, you worked for Corman, do a few films, then maybe you get that your own film made. And so there's this, um, always that first film. Who's seen Boxcar Bertha, Marty's first film? Yeah, not, not many people, but that's this Corman film. It's not very good, really. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting. But Peter's is actually in. Francis Coppola made a few that are, you know. What was his first film again? Is it Dementia? He did a few kind of yeah. on them. And then he started making much more kind of indie-ish films. He had his own unique path to the getting it, getting his, getting other films made. But I just think Peter, what he did with Targets is it's such a good first film. They did it, I don't know. I just am so impressed with what he got handed. It's a different tone. It's a darker movie. Peter's not dark in the in that way. It's about this you know, murderous True guy. story, right? Yeah, well, but based on, yeah. loosely based on our own Charles Whitman here in Austin. Yeah. Um, but he, he, he changed it up. I remember him telling me, you know, at the end of the movie, this guy, he perches with a rifle and he's shooting people. And it was Sam Fuller's idea to put it at a drive-in theater. Did you love that story? Yeah, so they're in a movie. So if these people are in a movie watching and the movie's kind of shooting them. This is fun. It's like, that was Sam Fuller's idea, very Fuller-ish He didn't idea. take credit either. Nah. He didn't want to do yeah, that. Yeah, so he had that. Which I think is amazing. He was mentored by all these right? great people. You know, it's so unfunny right now, the idea of shooting. Right. I mean, <laughs> I mean you it's know, never, like, great. The, but. the piece that he actually made was, you know, was the Boris Harloff. Yeah. Anyway, so that was the, the, the added piece of the, the true story. Mm -hmm. It was, you know. Which there was funny tones in it. Oh yeah. Although it's funny. Peter's in it. He's a great actor. Yeah. Ian Karloff and I don't know. It's so wonderful. And that film kind of it came out. I think the, the um, Martin Luther King. It came out right around the time of the, the big assassinations of '68. So that film, right. it it didn't play that much. It it didn't get the big release or the acclaim. It just proved he could make a good movie. I think within the industry or at least to people like Corman, but uh, yeah, it wasn't like a big hit or anything, but it, it's a cult film for it sure. It gave him his career. I mean, the yeah, beginning. Yeah, it gave him the last picture show. Yeah, because I think these first films, and it's the way indie films are now, you you know, everybody wants to be a filmmaker. It's like, well, you just gotta, you gotta make one. <laughs> you know, the proof is in the, in the in what you can do or can't do. So that, some things never change. So, but it was just at a different level. So he, it was such an interesting time that his generation, all those, all those guys came through and really, really triumphed, you know? They had a, you know, certainly that decade and, and, and beyond, but you know, the, the struggles always there. What, does Peter have one favorite film or does he, did, did, he, ever, did he ever, I've never heard him say, you know, I think he acknowledged some films are more beloved than others. I, I was doing a big thing with him once at the Directors Guild about Last Picture Show. And uh, I don't know, he, he made a joke, like, we're, you know, we're all talking about, you know, Last Picture Show, you know, it's such a masterpiece, you know. And he says, well, as Orson says, it only takes one. You know, <laughs> like, you only can make one really good film to be, so. Mm -hmm. But I think Peter knew he made a lot more than one. I think he loved all of them for different reasons, but he yeah. would say that he loved um, They All Laugh, but I think that was for personal reasons. Yeah. Um, he loved St. Jack. I mean, I think he just loved them for different reasons. I, I, he loved yeah. us, he even loved uh, At Long Last Love. Mm -hmm. But then he would always go back and do a director's cut because it was like almost his perfect to him. Mm -hmm. But that's what he would do, you know, so. Um, it's just, uh, I miss him a lot. It's just so great to see this on the yeah. big screen. Um, and I think he would just get a kick out of the fact that you did this for him. And, oh. 
and well, we're all here watching. Thank you for coming out yeah. and supporting Peter's movies yeah. because it's nice. Well, it's uh, we'll look forward to um, Squirrel. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and Netflix this summer. Yes. Oh, I'm so glad. That's so and we're also I'm so uh, happy for you. Thank you. Everyone involved in that. That film should be seen. Owen Wilson is great in it. I don't know. I just think that's under. He's amazing. Um, yeah. And and um, he's just a quirky his screwball. It's, it's modern. Great. Comedy, yeah, you know, sex it? comedy, you know what? Peter just loved that. It's so the tone good of what's up dog. Yeah, it's just yeah, the, right? yeah. Peter just had that tonal ability. Mm -hmm. that, you know, we all need to laugh, so yeah. check it out. Yeah, it's it's funny, very off kilter. And just to add a couple more things, point. he finished his memoir, and that's mm -hmm. going to come out at some point. All I want to do is direct. And then <laughs> that's um, a good title. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then. Um, yeah. St. Jack, his film that he made um, with Ben Gazzara, we're doing a limited series out of that. So, yeah, in the works of that. I'm, I'm going to continue. Yeah, that's a good. Film. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think that could. <laughs> that would be funny. Um, so, well, Louise, it's so so. Thank you for being here. Thank so you. special. It's great. That great to be here. And yeah. thank you guys. For being here. Okay, go to the paper room tomorrow night if you want. Like the Paramount, can't get enough. You want to see Ryan O'Neill and his daughter a couple years earlier. Right? <laughs> so, thanks so much. This was really wonderful, these three films. So, thank you guys for coming.